Well, you're, you're probably wondering why a fiction author is about to give you a presentation on autonomous robotic weapons. Let's see if my slide catches up. There we go. Well, those of you familiar with my books know that I, I write thrillers with a fair amount of technical accuracy. And I do that because I actually have a pretty extensive IT background. I spent nearly two decades uh, building transactional data systems for very large companies. So I design uh, distribution and planning systems. And I do know the power of data. Data runs modern society. So I'm a data guy, and increasingly, war is a data-driven enterprise. Modern militaries acquire data, not just aerial surveillance, but financial data, telecom data, even pocket litter from captured individuals is put into databases and cross-indexed to locate targets and to find meaning in context. And make no mistake, autonomous robotic weapons would be data sniffers. They would hunt for individuals following a data trail. And the modern world leaves a considerable data trail. So for the next half hour or so, I'd like to step you through some of the implications of that, how autonomous robotic weapons would use the data that the modern world produces, and how this actually could have the effect of fundamentally changing our society if we let it. But this is not going to be a screed against drones. I'm actually, I kind of think the technology is cool myself. Unmanned drones are going to have a ton of beneficial uses. Uh, precision ag agriculture is obviously a, a big one. Search and rescue, logistics, aerial photography, on and on. So there's going to be a lot of very good uses. So I'm not going to be spending my time saying that this, this is not a great enterprise. I think it's going to be very interesting. It's like any technology. It can be used for good or evil. And likewise, I, I want to delineate between remotely piloted systems, like the Predator and the Reaper, uh, which still have a human operator. A human is still making lethal decisions here. And our society knows how to deal with that. If, if we don't always deal with it perfectly, we know how to deal with a human being making a lethal decision. So what I'm focusing on is lethal autonomy, which is actually a technical term and has a very specific meaning. And the fact that you need a technical term for this now should tell you something because it is very quickly becoming a reality. And these are two automatic sniper stations currently deployed in the world. They're both deployed in the DMZ between North and South Korea. Now these can automatically identify and engage a human target, the one on the left at a distance of over a kilometer. Now in both these situations, in both these cases, uh, there's still a human in the loop, but that's a choice. It's not a technological requirement. And it's really that choice that I want to focus on. Because as we cede more decision making in war from humans to software, we will not only change or take the humanity out of war, but we may change society far from the battlefield. And that's because the tools that humans use to resolve conflict shape our social landscape. And it always has, all throughout history. These were state-of-the-art weapon systems in 1400 AD. The mounted armored knight and the castle. And these were both very expensive to build and maintain, but with them you could dominate the populace. And the distribution of political power in medieval society reflected this. Power was concentrated at the very top. So what changed? It was a technological innovation, gunpowder. And suddenly, a person with very little training could knock a mounted armored knight off of his horse. Castle walls could be brought down with cannons. And, and very quickly, it became not so much important who you brought to the battlefield versus how many people you brought to the battlefield. So as armies began to grow in size, the nation state arose as a logistical and political requirement of common defense. And as nobles had to rely on more and more of their people in time of war, they had to cede more power and representative government began to form. So again, the tools we use to resolve conflict shape our social landscape. 
And I think autonomous robotic weapons are such a tool. Except that by risking re-centralizing power, requiring very few hands to conduct warfare, they risk re-centralizing power and reversing a five-century trend toward democracy. Now, I think that by realizing this, we can take active steps to defend our democratic institutions. But you may, you may wonder why I bring this up now. Some of you here know that, that even autonomous drones have been around for decades. Matter of fact, this Ryan 147B lightning bug was developed in the late 50s and deployed in the 60s over Vietnam. And five of these were shot down over, over mainland China. Now, this was a fully autonomous combat drone. Now, it had a timer programmer, a, a gyroscope, an altimeter, and they would launch it from a B-52 and send it to fly for a certain distance at a certain altitude and go take pictures in hostile terrain. Then it would turn around and come back. Again, all without any human input. And this was actually part of a whole constellation of drones in the 50s and 60s, fully autonomous. But of course, they were dumb as a bag of rocks because there was no processing power. There was no uh, ability to react to new circumstances. And drones thus did not have a transformative effect on human conflict. Not until another revolution happened, and that was a revolution some people in here also participated in, the computer revolution. So suddenly we get to the point where processing power is cheap, storage is cheap, memory, uh, wireless technologies, satellite technologies, accelerometers, all of these things being produced all around the world very cheaply. This suddenly made unmanned systems very capable and also in incredibly compelling from a cost point of view, particularly versus a manned system. As you can see, a F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, $168 million a unit, and I'm told that's actually really low-balling it. Now, the Avenger system, $12 million a unit, but there's much more benefits to this, perceived benefits. That is, you don't risk your own people. Everybody in here knows all, the, all of these. You know, you, no crew fatigue, you can change crews, longer dwell times on and on. It's a, a, a truly compelling case for military planners, and this is one reason why 70 nations are now developing remotely piloted drones of their own. So there's th been this Cambrian explosion of drone species. And that's important because once you've developed and deployed remotely piloted drones, I feel there are three very compelling reasons pushing more decision making away from human beings and onto the weapon platform itself. The first of these is visual overload. Now, in 2004, the US drone fleet produced a grand total of 71 hours of surveillance video for analysis. Now, by 2011, that number had gone up to 300,000 hours every year of video to be analyzed. And that's too much video for anybody to look at. And even that is about to go up by an order of magnitude. The Gorgon Stare and Argus programs will put up to 65 independently operated camera eyes on board each and every drone. And this would vastly outstrip any human ability to view it all. Now combined with that, the requirement to send it all halfway around the world on satellite bandwidth, which is limited, and you can only launch so many uh, geostationary satellites. But what all of this means is that very quickly drones are going to need to use visual intelligence software to tell humans what they need to look at, not the other way around. There's a second compelling reason pushing more decision making away from people and onto the weapon platform itself. Signal jamming, separating, severing the signal between the drone and its operator. Now we saw an example of this also in 2011 when an RQ-170 Sentinel drone got a bit confused over Iran due to a GPS spoofing attack. Now, any remotely piloted system is susceptible to this type of attack, particularly against a sophisticated adversary. So again, this is another reason why drones very soon will be making more decisions. They'll need to understand their mission and react to new circumstances and all this. This is the incentive. But it leads us to our, our third and possibly most powerful incentive to push more decision-making onto drones. 
plausible deniability. Now, we live in a global world, uh, or a global economy, where, where low-cost, high-tech manufacturing occurs on almost every continent. And this is also a world where cyber espionage is spiriting away advanced plans to places unknown. And in that type of world, it is pretty much a given that successful drone designs will be knocked off in contract factories anywhere around the world. And with killer robots proliferating in the gray market, sifting through the wreckage of a of suicide drone attack, it will be nearly impossible to say who sent that drone, who launched that attack. And this, for the first time, raises the very troubling possibility of anonymous war. And what this means is it will be very difficult to direct firepower against an attacker. And this could tilt the traditional geopolitical balance on its head. And that could also potentially turn the advantage in the 21st century away from defense and toward offense. And this in turn could increase the possibility of warfare worldwide and make warfare a, a viable foreign and domestic policy solution for all sorts of individuals, not just, not just nation states, but criminal organizations, private enterprise, even powerful individuals. Now this could undermine the rule of law and freedom of speech and, and basically create a world of rival warlords. Now transparency and accountability are crucial to popular government. This type of situation would undermine both. Now, you might be thinking that citizens of a technologically advanced society would be better able to defend themselves against this type of eventuality, particularly against citizens of developing countries. But in truth, it's the exact opposite. And for one reason, to sum it up in one word, data. The modern world is powered by data, real-time data, cell phone geolocation, geolocation, social media, email, financial transactions, transportation data. This is a wealth of real-time data on the movements and social interactions of people. In short, we have become more visible to machines than any people in history. For example, most of us have a cell phone on us. This has a geolocation tag. Actually, it's called an uh, International mobile, mobile Equipment Identifier. And this is a unique number that's burned in at the factory. And this number is pinged to cell towers every few seconds. And it creates a constant record of our movements over many years. This is what it looks like. This is an individual, Aaron Parecki. He logged his movements over four years in the Portland area. And I can zoom in in this original image very closely. And it will show moment by moment where this person was over the last four years. Now, this data is mostly used for commercial purposes. As a matter, as a matter of fact, some interesting uh, uses were put to it. There's a company called TomTom Tom that uses this geolocation data. And bear in mind, 600 billion data points every single day in the United States, just from geolocations from cell phones. So companies like TomTom, Tom, use it to do real-time traffic analysis, so looking at the groupings of cell phones on highways. There's another company, uh, Sense Networks, that uses it to direct targeted ads. So if you're moving toward a store, they can look at your data and determine whether or not you see, need to see an ad on your phone or a message. Now, investors also use this geolocation data. Um, a hedge fund used it in 2008. Uh, they noticed that the taverns near Wall Street were filling up earlier and earlier in the day, and they got a little in early warning of impending doom. But in 2011, Science Magazine uh, reported on some researchers who had taken 1,000 individuals. They analyzed all of their geolocation data for a period of about a month, and then creating a simple algorithm that allowed them to predict with 93% accuracy what any individual would do next. And this, this shows some of the power of this constant data logging because data never goes away. Not in modern society. When the cost of acquiring data and storing it is essentially zero, it never gets deleted, ever. Bruce Schneier, a, a noted cryptographer and security analyst, 
He calls this data pollution. And I think it's a very valid description. Now in conflict areas where social media and telecom cell phones are widely used, you can imagine that this data is immensely useful. Because no matter what you do with modern technology, everything's logged. And this has given rise to a whole bunch of other technologies. And I'll name just a couple. There's a product called Directed Analysis that gives governments, powerful organizations, whoever can acquire the, the data, the ability to take a look at all IP traffic moving through a network to focus on a specific event, whether that's a protest or some disruption or some unfolding media event. There's another company that creates a product called Hone that allows them to pour through vast amounts of social media data to try to identify accounts that, are, that look separate but are actually one person. They look for word forms, similar emails, addresses, and so forth. There's also systems that analyze voice traffic. <laughs> and again, not just in this country, but perhaps elsewhere in the world where there is a repressive government, this is, could be widely used. Again, it doesn't matter the language, it looks for word forms, similarities to identify people. Again, connecting everything together. Now here is what's called a link analysis map. And this is a map of a group of people with all of their social connections represented by connecting lines. Now this type of map can be readily produced from uh, the data that the modern world uh, produces as we move. Usually it's used to produce, uh, to sell products and services to certain demographics, but it is a dual use technology. Because of course, targeting can be used in another context. Now notice certain people are highlighted. These people are the hubs of social networks. They're opinion makers, organizers, leaders. They connect people to each other. Now in modern societies, these people can be identified from their communication patterns. Now, if you're selling products and services, you might then sell them, send them product samples. But if you're a repressive government, you might instead eliminate them. And those who remain are no longer a cohesive, effective group. They are a disorganized mob. Now, connect this. Picture that in a world of cheap, proliferating robotic weapons, borders would offer very little protection against critics of transnational criminal organizations or dictatorships. Popular movements agitating for change could be detected early and their leaders eliminated before that group's ideas achieve critical mass. And ideas achieving critical mass is what popular government and social media is all about. And the anonymity of autonomous weapons would make lethal force a viable option for many competing entities. And this could imperil civil society and disempower popular political action, which is the very heart of democratic government. So we have to ask ourselves, is technology going to empower authoritarian governments of the 21st century? Will it give it an advantage? This, in many reasons, is why I feel that we absolutely need a ban on robotic lethal weapons particularly killer robots. Now we have international treaties on nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, and they're not perfect, but they have by and large worked. And certainly as a statement of principles, they work. And in fact, robotic weapons might represent every bit as much of a threat as nuclear weapons because they will undoubtedly be used. And as I've demonstrated, they could distort our democratic institutions. Now in November 2012, the US Department of Defense issued a decree that requires a human be in the loop in all lethal decision making. And this is right now a temporary directive, but it needs to be made permanent. <coughs> and we do need to codify a legal framework around autonomous weapons. And we need to do it now before there's a terrible incident or terrorist attack that causes nations of the world to rush to deploy weapons like these in perceived self-defense. Before we can think through the consequences and realize their potential to centralize power into very few unseen hands, 
and thus undermine our democratic institutions. Now, you might wonder how we could benefit from a, the autonomous vehicles that we've seen all day while still defending ourselves against illicit autonomous robotic weapons. And I've actually got some thoughts there. No robot should have an expectation of privacy in a public place. Now, earlier, we saw Frank, he talked about a license plate. I would propose a cryptographically signed ID burned in at the factory emanating from every license drawn. Now, cars have license plates, airplanes have tail numbers, this would be no different but it would emanate outwards and it could be paired with a civic app that is made available to everybody in society so that they can check the population of drones in the airspace and on the ground around them. Not just right now, but going back in history so they can have a right to see what machines are moving through their environment. Likewise, governments should deploy drone, rogue drone detectors that could detect drones that are unlicensed. And rather than sending out other drones to shoot them down, they could alert humans for follow-up. Now, in certain very high security areas, I could picture drones going out to snare them and drag the illicit drone off to some bomb disposal unit. But notice that this is not a weapon system I'm describing. It's an immune system. It allows us to benefit from all the positive uses of drones while still protecting ourselves against illicit uses of drones. Because we must ban the deployment and development of killer robots. Let's not succumb to the temptation to automate warfare. There is no doubt that dictatorships and criminal organizations will do so, but let's not join them. Autonomous weapons represent too much of a threat to our democratic institutions by centralizing too much power into too few and unseen hands. So for democracies at least, let's make sure that autonomous robotic weapons remain fiction. Thank you.